Thank you, uh, Giovanna, for uh, bringing us together again after last year's excellent uh, event. Uh, I think you managed to bring indeed all the stakeholders, even artists, uh, journalists, joining us uh, in, this, uh, in this debate. And today I want to give a, a bit of a, a, a general introduction into, uh, into the topic and then uh, propose to you uh, to, to, to think a bit more out of the box and think of what uh, people call the gig economy in a much uh, broader way so that we can uh, have a, a more uh, critical lens on, uh, on possible futures, what we want with platforms and what we may not want with platforms. I'm going to talk uh, about uh, platform economy, then I'm going to uh, show you some numbers about uh, the gig economy in, in particular, and then I'm, uh, I will try to, uh, to draft you for five key questions that I think we should, uh, we should uh, address in these days. Now, the, the conference is about platform economy. And I think it's a good word uh, because it encompasses the main uh, technological and economic changes of the past uh, 20 years. Never in history has there been uh, such an, um, let's say, a revolution in economic terms with the main uh, companies uh, being present today, being founded just 10, 20 or 25 years ago. But what is then the platform economy? I use uh, Martin Kenny's uh, simple definition that a platform uh, is anything that mediates both social and economic interactions online. And this simple definition allows us uh, to see the full picture of, uh, of platforms. Because if, if you want to think about the platform economy, you really have to uh, no, uh, uh, take into account that it's not a flat uh, a world out there. They're not just platforms that people uh, use. These platforms can only run uh, in a technological infrastructure where we basically have two main providers that we're now all very much dependent on, on. And unsurprisingly, these are also now the two most valuable firms in the world. And uh, the platforms themselves are reliant on users, not uh, only as clients, but also as the main producers of the content or the work uh, uh, or the assets that are being exchanged, traded, uh, swapped, uh, shared uh, online. And uh, I did a, a simple uh, search. Apparently, there are now almost 5 billion mobile phone users out there in the world. And if you assume they have at least one platform on their phone, uh, one app downloaded uh, that they use, uh, we have uh, already uh, uh, 5, 000, 5 billion uh, users in this platform economy. Uh, a bit of history. For me, th th these are the, the, the five main uh, waves of, uh, of, 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 of platforms, the, the, the kind of sectors one by one where platforms entered and where they produced a winner, at least if you take a more Western uh, point of view. So e-commerce uh, started uh, with the founding of, of Amazon and many other uh, companies uh, and uh, produced then Amazon as the main winner. For example, in the US, more than half of the online e-commerce transaction go through <coughs> Amazon. Yeah, so uh, th 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 this is hard to uh, phantom wh what kind of revolution this has been in, in, in retail uh, uh, as well as in, in some other sectors that, I, that they have entered. Then we have the second-hand markets where people started to, to trade their own goods. And of course, eBay and, and, and those type of platforms are, are, are not as valuable as, 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 as Amazon, for example. It was the advent of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, use of platforms. Yeah? So uh, this is still the business to consumer. And here people started to, uh, if you like, uh, be empowered to, to start using platforms for their own benefit. And that peer-to-peer -peer logic <laughs> continued with social media, with sharing economy, where people uh, rent out or lend out their, their, their assets, like cars or homes, and then uh, uh, also a platforms where people uh, started to offer personal services. 
Now today we are going to focus, at least my talk will going to focus on, on gig economy and I think most of the debates uh, are related to that. But there are of course issues that are more generic to platforms. Uh, for example, privacy and the new privacy law in Europe. We have to see how that uh, plays out. Antitrust issues that apply to all uh, platforms. Discrimination issues uh, that uh, apply to, to all platforms. Security issues. Uh, and all that. So we, I think we should not forget the multi-dimensional nature of these platforms. Uh, but if you th think about gig economy platforms, that brings in the whole labor uh, problem uh, into, uh, into the picture. Uh, and that's why um, the unions, uh, labor law, um, all kinds of actors that were rather absent in these uh, discussions now start to enter the debate. Now here are some examples of uh, gig economy platforms and uh, what is apparent is that the gig economy is invading many sectors in the uh, economy. Yeah, so we have uh, cleaning, uh, people helping each other out, we have teaching, handyman, taxi, babysitting and all kinds of uh, digital work, legal services, food delivery, and what you obviously see now is many entrepreneurs trying to copy uh, the gig economy platform model to new sectors, finding out what business models work uh, in, in, in new contexts. And the first question people ask, both consultants, both uh, policy makers, both academics, uh, is it really such a big phenomenon? Uh, and uh, what, what can we say quantitatively about uh, the gig economy? So we have seen uh, a lot of reports in the last two, three years trying to, to capture this, uh, this phenomenon in numbers. And, and obviously you, you have to define before you can measure what's in and what's out. And then uh, you will see that uh, people have come up with very different and sometimes very uh, elaborated definitions. Uh, and uh, when they then do surveys based on those definitions, uh, they come up with very different numbers. Uh, and one reason is obviously that different definitions lead to different numbers, but also some surveys ask, did you ever um, provide any service through a platform last year May, uh, or ever in your life uh, or maybe only last month? Uh, and uh, other surveys again uh, uh, ask you whether you made substantial money out of platforms. So all these definitions lead to different numbers. Yeah. Uh, and for example, this was the main report in the Netherlands this year, uh, commissioned by the Ministry of Social Affairs and Employment. And they had a very restricted definition of the gig economy. For them, it was only physical labor, not digital labor, uh, by people who really got most of their assignments online. Yeah. So, so most of what they do had to be mediated uh, online. And then basically you only end up uh, with food delivery, taxi and cleaning. And then uh, you get a very low number and then some people start to say, well, so why uh, bother so much about this phenomenon? It only happens in certain sectors, so let's find solutions for those sectors. Uh, but if you take a much broader uh, view uh, and also look uh, if people ever uh, did any work uh, through any kind of platform, then you can get uh, numbers up to 22%, uh, for example, for Italy. Now, for the US, uh, the figures are a bit, uh, converge a bit more, definitions converge a bit more, um, and, um, and for example, the latest report by GP Morgan, which was really based on transaction data that they got from banks, uh, they could figure out that uh, only in, in the last month, 1.6% made money on the gig economy the last month. So uh, this starts to become a serious uh, phenomenon. Now, if you go through all these reports, and I don't necessarily recommend you to do so, uh, but these are for me the main takeaways. So uh, it's a phenomenon uh, where uh, on average uh, more younger people, more high skilled people and more people living in urban areas uh, participate in. And what's very important, uh, probably known to many of you, most of the gig workers use gig work to supplement 
their income. So they have other sources of I income, which can be an own business, which can be a regular job, which can be uh, living from your parents. So for, for relatively few people, it is the main source uh, of income. And, uh, and for those that it is, it's mainly in the transportation sector and mainly in the taxi sector in the US. There you see a, a lot of people being dependent on, uh, on Uber or Lyft uh, for, their, for their main income. And that also happens to be by far the largest sector in the gig economy. Yeah, so if you, if you, if, if you, if you really want to uh, point down which sector this business model uh, is most successful, it is the transportation sector, both food delivery and uh, taxis. Now, uh, the size of the gig, gig economy is very sensitive to definitions, and that's why I want to spend a bit more time on the definition, not to propose uh, yet a new definition, but to show that we will never resolve this, but what is useful of a definition it, uh, is that it's, uh, it, it highlights the main dimensions of a phenomenon that can come in one uh, manifestation or another. That's, that it shows you the main variables to discuss how are we going to uh, institutionalize this, uh, this gig economy. So I think the most common definition, if you would have to make one definition out of the existing definitions, would for me be this. It's about freelancers performing paid labor through one-off short-term assignments, gigs, mediated by online platforms, okay? Uh, and if you adhere to this definition strictly, that is, if you look at platforms uh, that uh, comply to all these features, all these uh, aspects, there are only really four platforms that would, uh, or let's say four sectors and then uh, four main platforms in those sectors that, uh, that would qualify uh, to gig economy, right? Because Uber, these are free uh, lances uh, uh, that are paid for their labor in one of assignments, uh, mediated online. Same for uh, Amazon Mechanical Turks, <coughs> uh, digital work, handyman services, uh, and uh, Deliveroo, okay? And obviously, we want to understand the gig economy as a much broader phenomenon, uh, because there are many more platforms out there successful and unsuccessful, for profit, not for profit, um, emerging or already uh, existing longer, that we need to take into account, not just to understand the phenomenon, but also to understand the options that we have. Yeah, the varieties in which gig economy uh, manifests itself and what policies we can think of uh, to steer the uh, that kind of economy in one direction or another. So we have to go from a definition, uh, this de definition, to what are the main variables? What are the main features, uh, uh, or if you like, from a design perspective, the design specifications uh, that we can uh, identify and, and, and need to discuss how uh, we want to uh, create this uh, gig economy in the future. So the first thing is, do we really need to talk about freelancers? Yeah? Of course, uh, that's the whole debate about classification of workers. Yeah? Uh, if we uh, want to classify them differently as employees, it would still count as gig economy because uh, the gigs they perform remain the same and, uh, and it's still uh, mediated online. The second thing we have to talk about is whether we only want to talk about paid labor or also unpaid labor. And unpaid labor, uh, in turn, comes in many forms and is very hidden and also hard for us as academics uh, to identify, but it's fast. Yeah? And it's also variable historically, what is paid, what is unpaid, also depends on our institutions. Do we really only have to talk about labor in a strict sense? That is the time that people put in to perform a certain gig, or uh, do we also need to take into account the role of capital? the role of capital goods that people use in performing uh, gigs. And then you feel it coming, sharing economy is not so uh, far away. Do we only need to talk about one-off assignments? Because we see in many sectors, transactions are repeated. P 
people are doing the same cleaning job uh, at the same uh, person's home many times. What then is the role and the value added of platforms? And last but not least, and this is where I deviate, I guess, from most uh, reports and, and other academics, do we really need to define the gig economy as an uh, economy where the transactions are mediated online? Because if you look carefully, historically, we have always uh, had intermediary agencies that had to mediate these transactions through telephone, for example, or through informal social networks, or uh, through uh, advertisements. Uh, so these are the five dimensions I want, to, uh, I want to go through in the remainder of the talk, and then try to figure out along of, each di of these dimensions, what are the main questions for us academics, uh, businesses, uh, policy makers to, to address. Now here uh, I have uh, some examples of platforms that we usually uh, consider, maybe not Airbnb, but others as gig economy, but that do not adhere to, these, uh, to this strict definition. Uh, for example, uh, Foodora, uh, at least in, uh, in the countries I know of, they employ their riders. And although they had to stop their business in the Netherlands quite recently, uh, apparently not able to cope with uh, the competition, they are still active uh, and uh, successful in some other countries with uh, an employee model. So gig economy uh, um, uh, is orthogonal to the question whether you use freelance or not. You can also use employees. Then we have all those platforms where people uh, help each other out, uh, do, uh, yeah, do, do care kind of services or psychological services or babysit service without being paid. And in the Netherlands, for example, we have a platform called We Help. Then, uh, and that's uh, maybe the trickiest uh, part, uh, we have platforms where people perform labor but the main value they create is not through their labor, but through their assets that, uh, that they uh, rent out to other people. And obviously Airbnb is uh, the platform where the assets are most valuable and where people make most of uh, the money. But to rent out your home, labor is involved. E uh, even if you outsource that labor again to a cleaner or a key exchange agency, you can consider it a gig in the sense that it is a one-off um, short-term uh, assignment, short-term service that you perform uh, via an online uh, uh, platform. Now, then we have Helpling uh, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, let's say the sectors of cleaning, babysitting, tutoring, where uh, in most cases uh, people on a regular basis uh, perform the same service to the same people. So then we have a platform with recurrent transactions. It turns out that then the, the, the standard Uber type of business model is very difficult to operate. It's very difficult to ask a commission every time the same person performs the same gig with the same people because they can simply organize those transactions outside the platform. And then interestingly, uh, there if you look carefully, there were already many agencies out there that performed the same functions as platforms do now in mediating supply and demand of personal services. And for example, one we discovered uh, recently is Homeworks, already exists for, I think, 15 years. And this is a telephone number that you can call to hire a cleaner for a one-off assignment. It's a telephone number. It says on the website, uh, and it performs the exact same function as helpling. And again, I would uh, consider that gig economy. So if we allow ourselves to change these features and also to look at other type of flat platforms, uh, then the gig economy is much larger than most people uh, previously defined. And it also means that the potential impacts of platforms, if they do enter in all those sectors, 
it may be much larger than we, uh, than we think right now. So what are my five questions uh, that I can derive from this, uh, this definition? Well, the first question is freelance versus employed. And I, I know many of you uh, are, uh, are dealing with uh, the question from a legal point of view or a policy point of view, um, should uh, gig workers be classified as freelancers or as employees uh, of the platform? Or should we create a third category in between? which in some countries already exists. Uh, but this question goes beyond just a classification issue of gig workers. First of all, there is another classification issue. How should we classify the platform? Because uh, the classification of a platform may automatically uh, lead to certain regulations also applying to people who work through the platform. So, for example, some of the platforms you may consider as a temp agency, right? Because uh, they uh, provide the service uh, for, for other people to hire uh, people on a short-term basis. And if uh, the client is actually exercising power over uh, the gig worker, you can say the temp agency uh, should be regulated uh, or the, the platform should be regulated as a temp agency. Then, of course, there are sectoral definitions that matter. Does Uber belong to the taxi sector or to the e-commerce sector? And this was, uh, at least a couple of years ago, not obvious. <coughs> but at least in Europe, country after country after country, and also the European Court, classifies Uber as a taxi company. Probably for the same reason why you could classify helpling <laughs> as a cleaning company uh, because what the people perform are cleaning services. So regulations uh, already applying to domestic cleaning in the Netherlands, for example, should also apply to helpling. And in fact, helpling adheres to those regulations. So these are all the classifications issues. Now then, another takeaway on this issue for me is don't focus only on the labor law issue. Now, I learned a lot about labor law the last couple of years, <laughs> not being trained at all in legal issues. And uh, yeah, it turns out to be rather complicated. Um, but it's not only a question of whether uh, the platform exercises control uh, and, um, and, 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 and in that sense acts as an employee making gig workers, uh, act as an employer, making the gig workers employees. You, we can also go through the economic route, through competition law, because what gig workers do is they compete uh, on a market uh, for particular services, and that makes, and, and they decide themselves when to work, for whom to work, um, how to perform uh, the gig to, to a large extent, which makes them, in the eyes of many governments, independent businesses, freelancers, meaning they have to adhere to the competition law. And that means, in turn, they are not allowed to unionize, at least they can organize, but they cannot uh, collude on prices. Yeah? Uh, they may start a cooperative, but also for cooperatives, Judith Shore will talk about that tomorrow, but also for cooperative, the competition, competition law applies. And, and, and you cannot just start a, a cooperative and not uh, comply to a competition law. So I would plea for economists uh, and also uh, competition lawyers to help us in thinking if we can amend also the competition law. And there are already attempts in certain US states where platform workers are exempted from competition law and are allowed to unionize and to negotiate uh, on prices. Um, and, um, and, 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 and yeah, so we also have to rethink uh, competition law. Another more subtle issue that I 
started to realize only last year is that platforms can also be criticized from competition law in that they constrain workers to grow their business. So if you are an independent business, it means you should be allowed to grow your business. That's the whole purpose of founding a business. And that's also why governments promote people to found new businesses, hoping they will create uh, new jobs, uh, new services, new business models. But if you found your own business, that is, if you go to the Chamber of Commerce and register as a, as a gig worker, which you have to do, eh? that doesn't mean you can grow a business because uh, the amount of work that you are allowed uh, and, and capable to, um, to perform through a platform is constrained by your individual digital identity. Yeah? So if I sign up as a rider, I cannot perform two rides at the same time. So I'm not allowed to hire someone else and to perform two rides at the same time. I cannot grow my business. I cannot multiply uh, myself. And that, that means that in, from a competition law perspective, you could argue these people are not businesses. Yeah? So rather than always saying, OK, maybe uh, they, sh they should be considered employees, you can also uh, start from the other question, are they really businesses? Yeah? Well, they are not uh, allowed uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to grow their business. And in that sense, they are constrained. Second question, something I haven't looked into really, but I think it's interesting. Uh, again, to broaden our, our, our scope and to think about the opportunities, but also possible downsides of organizing voluntary work and other forms of unpaid work through platforms. Now, obviously, uh, I think there are great opportunities for voluntary organizations to reach out to a much broader pool of potential voluntary workers by creating a platform. Yeah, imagine uh, uh, students or uh, expats or uh, people with a busy life, they probably uh, have trouble uh, to commit themselves to voluntary work, say every Saturday I'm going to work for eight hours uh, for a voluntary organization. Nevertheless, they may want to do occasionally uh, voluntary work. And then uh, for these voluntary gigs, if you like, a platform is perfect. But then we can ask the question, if these people then get some reward for that, because uh, this uh, interesting uh, case in Belgium uh, tries to create a kind of uh, hybrid between voluntary work and paid work. That is, the, uh, in, in through this platform, you can sign up as a voluntary worker but you get a remuneration, but much lower than the minimum wage. It's to cover your expenses, basically. And that's also how the tax office looks at those, uh, as those uh, income. You don't need to pay taxes over that because it's to cover your own expenses, uh, like traveling to, uh, to the voluntary organization and such. And in this way, they may be able to unleash a huge potential of, poten of, of, of voluntary workers, but at the same time, they create a problem, an institutional problem, because the unions are not happy with, these, with this type of work. They say, listen, we have professional organizations uh, that take care of, uh, uh, of, 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 for example, home care or uh, people that, that are in need of help, and they are paid according to... Um, uh, labor agreements and we have true voluntary organizations where people unpaid uh, uh, deliver their service and if you are now going to create something in between then uh, you create unfair competition uh, with uh, professional uh, service uh, uh, providers so again we have a kind of uh, hard to classify platform but in, in this case, it's in the voluntary work sector. So we need to figure out if we want these type of platforms, and if so, in what ways people can be rewarded for voluntary work. Um, maybe not monetary, can also be with alternative coins or, or uh, vouchers. Uh, 
but it may be a way uh, to uh, get much, many more people to do voluntary work. Now then I come to the, and that's the typical economic uh, question to ask, the labor capital uh, question. So where do labor and capital come in uh, on platforms? Well, um, obviously uh, the gig workers are paid for their labor and they're usually paid uh, when they, uh, per hour or per, uh, per task. But in performing that labor, they usually need some capital goods, their own bike, their own car, or in the case of sharing economy, renting out your house. You need uh, to own a house in the first place to perform uh, this, uh, this rental service uh, to, to others. Now, the question then is, will these platforms increase uh, inequality a trend that is already going on for the past 30 years and that has to do with Piketty. You probably know about the economist Piketty uh, that uh, found out that in the last uh, couple of decades uh, the return on assets, the return on wealth is much higher than uh, wage, uh, wages are increasing. That means that people that already earn a lot of assets uh, see their income rising much faster than people who do not earn uh, any assets. And if we then also can rent out our assets through platforms or use our assets in performing gigs, then people owning assets can even make more money compared to those that do not. So that's about the sharing economy. And I think many people uh, realize that the sharing economy uh, mainly benefits uh, homeowners because most of the turnover in the sharing economy is with uh, home sharing. Um, but does it also apply to pure gigs? And then you can turn to the notion of human capital. So some people have very unique skills. So they have human capital, for example, uh, they learned a specific skill uh, um, or by experience they acquired a specific skill while many others have no unique skills and can only perform very basic services like driving or cleaning. Now it turns out, and labor economists pointed to this already uh, a while ago, that if you have specific skills, you are a winner in the platform economy because the platforms allow you to reach out to a much bigger market and only if you can reach out to a very big market, your unique skill uh, can be sold uh, to, to many persons. While before the advent of platforms, you may have a unique skill, but you didn't know anyone who wanted to buy this skill because uh, this match could not be made. At the same time, we also know, at least for transportation, that people with uh, basic skills, like driving, have seen their wages go down. Yeah, the same GP Morgan uh, report I mentioned before of this year showed that in many sectors the wages uh, have gone up, uh, also uh, in sectors mediated by platform, but the big exception being transportation, where wages have gone down. Yeah? And of course that also had to do with the regulated nature of taxi uh, markets, uh, but it also has to do with fiercer competition, high, uh, high commissions uh, that need to be paid, um, uh, and so forth. So for economists, yeah, I think this is the key question to ask and, and uh, in extensio also for policymakers that worry about the already increased inequality that may um, uh, continue in the near future. Now my fourth question is about should we only look as gigs as one-off? which in the original meaning you could say it is, right? You hire a band and they uh, perform a one-off uh, gig. Or should we also look at all those markets that are not yet uh, seen a lot of platforms um, being successful uh, where uh, transactions are recurrent? So think of care, think of education, and think of cleaning. Uh, and, and other kinds of uh, domestic services. These are huge markets. Yeah? Only think of the care 
and 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 the education market. The, the, these are the the bigger the biggest sectors in in our economy. The the problem is that uh, to run a, pro a, a, a successful platform in a market with recurrent transactions, you have to find other ways to add value. Yeah. If you have one of transactions, the main value you produce is by making the transaction possible. Each time the, uh, the match needs to be made, each time trust has to be established, each time payment has to be organized, etc., uh, etc. Et so that's your typical Uber, Airbnb uh, <coughs> platform which we have seen growing so fast. But in recurrent transactions, you only add this value the first time. But once the first match is made and people are satisfied, five minutes, uh, they can go on without the platform. Yeah? And that's why uh, you see, uh, for example, Helpling as a cleaning platform struggle. Yeah? So what do they do? Uh, they invent uh, a discount if you hire someone 10 weeks in a row. <laughs> yeah? uh, they also sanction cleaners uh, who uh, do their second assignment at the same home offline. If they find this out, and they have ways to find this out maybe by gossiping uh, among, uh, among cleaners or uh, in other ways or by, by calling uh, clients, whatever, but if they find out, they ban cleaners from the platform. Yeah? And uh, there are obvious moral uh, objections to this, but the reason they do this is they don't want people uh, to start running their own business offline uh, when the first match is made uh, online through helpling. So what you see now in most cases in these sectors is that people go to another business model and they go to a subscription-based business model where cleaners, tutors, babysitters, uh, care providers uh, provide monthly uh, a subscription fee to the platform uh, and that allows them uh, to put their advertisement on, on the platform, and that's it. So it's more like a yellow page business model. But then there's not so much money to, be, to make out of subscriptions, so the question is, can you then also offer additional services uh, above uh, just this advertisement uh, function? Now, my last uh, slide uh, is the question, can and should we organize more work through platforms? Okay. And this is not just a business question, because obviously entrepreneurs all over the world are trying to build platforms uh, in new sectors, with new functionalities, with new features, uh, because they see uh, how successful platforms have been in other sectors. So we don't need to worry about entrepreneurship. Eh? There's enough entrepreneurship out there uh, in terms of platforms because it doesn't take so much uh, skill uh, to start a platform in the first place. The real question is, where will the platforms really succeed and do we want them to succeed in all sectors? Yeah? Because they bring obvious benefits, especially to clients usually in lower prices, more flexibility, more variety of services, but they also create uh, problems, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in, in lower wages or deteriorating labor conditions or regulatory uh, issues and so forth. So my, uh, my feeling is that the two main sectors where uh, we really um, can still think how we want to organize those platforms before, um, let's say, uh, business uh, models uh, arrive that later on we might regret, are education and, and care, including healthcare. The reason is that these are public sectors in most European countries at least, meaning there are already uh, very uh, established large organizations uh, providing care, providing education. And they have to think if they don't want to transform themselves into platforms before commercial <laughs> platforms will do so. Yeah? I'll give you an example from my own experience as a university uh, employee. 
Uh, colleagues of mine, I've not been bothered yet, unfortunately, colleagues of mine are pressurized by uh, the administration to develop online courses and to do so with commercial scientific publishers. Because commercial scientific publishers like Elsevier, Prentice Hall, they see a whole new business, not just in printing texts, what they used to do, but also in organizing teaching and organizing courses organizing visual content. So what is happening is that people record their lectures and then the platforms will make money out of those lectures because they can be replicated at zero cost uh, and they can be uh, you know, uh, enriched with other services where those publishers are good at. The alternative would be, and I don't see this happening unfortunately, is that the universities, for example, in Europe start their own platform where we all upload our, uh, our recordings and uh, our courses and that indeed uh, people around Europe can follow courses uh, at a distance at each university. And the reason it's not happening is because universities have never been disrupted. They have never been threatened uh, in their core business, uh, so they are not organized. And to the extent they are organized, it's usually at the national level but not at the transnational level. So they really have to uh, start thinking how they can make use of the opportunities of platforms before other people do it for them. So to wrap up, my main uh, proposal to you is to think of the gig economy in a very broad sense, not just the typical one-off freelance paid assignments mediated through platforms, but basically think of the gig economy as all those short-term assignments that are being traded either for money or in other ways. So in that sense, uh, it, it, it encompasses a lot of our uh, work. And if you uh, adhere to a much broader definition, you can ask also broader questions. Uh, how should we regulate the gig economy in terms of freelance or employee? and especially also looking at co competition law. Uh, what do we know about unpaid work and, and, and what are the opportunities for platforms in that, in that type of work? What are the outcomes of platforms in terms of economic uh, inequality? And what can we do about it? I forgot to say that there is a simple economic way to remedy the unequal outcomes, that is to increase the taxes on capital especially on houses, and decrease the taxes on labor. Almost all economists are proposing this now, but politically it's very sensitive because we have so many homeowners. <laughs> they d usually don't vote for parties that want to increase taxes on, on housing. But that is economic 101 solution to, uh, at least one of the solutions to, to rising inequality due to um, uh, the higher returns on capital. What business model for recurrent transactions? And should more work be organized through platforms, especially in public sectors? How are, is the public sector going to make use of platforms in a way that they still control uh, the future of their sector rather than being disrupted uh, as we have seen in other sectors? Thank you.